excited. My name is Justin Arbuckle, and uh, Pastor Archie is out in Israel, and so while he is out, he said, hey, you preach on tithing as we begin our new series, but we're excited to dive into God's Word as we begin this new series, Investments, the Gospel and Giving. So if you have your copy of God's Word, Malachi chapter 3, turn your Bible to Malachi chapter 3, and you can get your handout out, or maybe power your phone on, uh, or your tablet, and get to Malachi chapter 3. And we look at giving when we look at the idea of investments, you know, the ease of giving increases based on the perceived importance. So the ease of giving increases. We will give more easily when the perceived importance increases. And you may say, you know, perceived importance. You know, when we were first married, uh, my wife and I, maybe two or three years she lived in uh, Florida, and so something they would do as gifts is give like a Disney stock, one stock of Disney that would be kind of a little, you know, document that you could put, had Mickey Mouse on it and things. And so I was like, oh, I'm, we would get these checks for 67 cents in the mail from Disney company. So I called them and said, hey, I want to invest the dividends. I don't want to keep getting 67 cent checks that we're not going to ever cash or do anything with. They said, well, you have to buy 10 stocks. You have to buy 10 to get it to reinvest. And so I talked to my wife. She's like, yeah, buy 10 of them. And I'm like, no. You know, it's like $15 a share. And I was like, it wasn't very important to me. And I thought, ah, we'll just leave it sitting there in our lockbox with this little pretty, you know, share of Disney stock. Well, I think as of like last year, it had risen like 700%, you know, in, increase of the investment where it had gone up. And my wife always hangs over my head. Why didn't you invest in that single stock. Why did you not buy that? And I said, well, it wasn't important to me, and therefore I didn't invest in it. And she's like, we could have, you know, had all this money. And so when we look at, we invest more easily when we have a perceived importance of it. And before, you know what, women, this happens as well when I talk to my wife, and she says, I don't have anything to wear. And we're standing, and I look at her closet full of clothes, and I'm saying, nothing to wear. You have a closet full of clothes. I need to go shopping. I need to buy clothes. And she says, I don't, you don't need to buy anything because you have a closet full. But see, her importance is, I don't have anything to wear to that event. Or I don't have anything to wear to that. And so she is trying to increase, you know what, the importance of the new clothes. Or for men, you know what, next season, or next week starts you know, rifle season. So maybe you have been telling your wife, you know what, I need a new gun for deer season, for rifle season, so that I can provide meat for the family. You know what, God's called me to be a provider, and I need that new gun or that new all-terrain vehicle, you know, that's going to help me provide for the family. You see, we start justifying things that are perceived important to us so that we can try to ease our way into giving. We want people to give. I've never seen a child want to communicate with their parents more than when a new iPhone comes out. You start hearing teenagers say, mom, dad, you can see where I'm at. You know, we can communicate if I get scared or if I get left. You know, I, we have all these children getting left, I suppose, because they all need new iPhones so that they can communicate with their parents. They're trying to raise the importance of communication because they want the ease of giving them a new phone to be easier. You see, we start justifying things as very important when we want our spouse or, you know, or someone else to give to it because the ease of giving increases based on the level of perceived importance. So as we look today and say investments, the gospel and giving, I believe when we see what Jesus Christ has done, the gospel when we understand the importance of the gospel, it will increase, you know what, our understanding of why we need to give. I believe that our giving must be fueled by the gospel and not enforced by guilt. My goal today is not to make you feel guilty because you don't give. 
my goal today is for us to see the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, and what that has done for our life and how that fuels, how that ignites a generous giver. You see, many leaders will say, if you want to know what is important to a person, look in two places. The first is their calendar, and the second is their bank statement. Because if you want to know what is important, look at where they spend their time and their money. And you may say, Hi, every time I come to church, they talk about giving. You know, maybe you come and they're saying, every time they're talking about giving to the church. Well, Jesus, over 2,000 ta- times in the Gospels, talked about money, wealth, or possession. Like over one-third of his parables had to deal with money, wealth, and possessions. But here's what I want you to hear. I don't think Jesus' main concern was if you have money, wealth, and possessions. His main concern was, do money, wealth, and possessions have you? Because that's what we're looking at today. Are we focusing on the gospel or are we focusing on our stuff? This morning, as we look in Malachi chapter 3, I want us to ask, what are we investing in? And will it last for eternity? Stand with me as we read Malachi chapter 3. Verse 7 through 12. Malachi chapter 3, verse 7 through 12. I'm reading now the New American Standard Version. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up for you windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, that it it instructs us, that it guides us, that it rebukes us. And so, Father, I pray this morning you would be our teacher. Spirit, I pray that your presence would be evident in this room. That, Lord, you would call us to repentance, that you would call us into obedience, and, and that your presence would remind us of who God is and who we are in light of that. And so, Lord, let us live like you've called us to be. So, Father, we thank you for being with us today. Be our teacher and our guide. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So as we look and understand the idea of giving, giving should be ignited by the gospel and not enforced by guilt, by guilt well, then we have to understand that giving is in response to His grace. Giving is a response to His grace. Look at verse 7. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes. So the book of Malachi is at the end of the Old Testament. Last book in the Old Testament, but it's probably written around 433 B.C., 400 years before Christ comes, and it's the contemporary of Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah. So Nehemiah was building the wall. And so the people of Israel were in captivity. And then when the Babylonians were overtaken by the Persians, Israel was allowed to come back to Jerusalem. So it's post-exile. They're in Jerusalem, and it's the second temple. So they're building the temple, and you may say, you lost me. You lost me at Persians. But here's what you have to understand. These are the people of God who have physically been brought back to the land of God, but whose hearts were far from him. You see, they were going through the motions. They were rebuilt the temple. Nehemiah's rebuilding the wall. But the messenger, Malachi, which is what Malachi means in Hebrew, the messenger came to them and said, from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes. What are his statutes? You know what? The law that was given, the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother. Worship God. You know, the temple, setting up the idea of honoring God with their hearts. They have turned from that. And he's saying, if you want to be a generous giver, you have to remember 
the covenant I made with you. What was the covenant? The covenant was I am. When Moses was standing on Mount Sinai, who should I say, you know, will go for them? Tell them I am sent you. Abraham, get up and leave from, you know what, your people and I will make you a people. So we see these covenants that God has said, you are mine. I am yours. I will never leave you or forsake you. And so God is, rem- God is reminding his people that I have made a covenant with you. And it says, from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you. What are they returning to? They are returning to a covenantal God who loves them. If you have your copy of God's Word, turn over to Malachi at the very beginning. Chapter 1, verse 2. He starts the book with, I have loved you, says the Lord. Now this, Malachi is not a lovely letter. He, he's chastising them. He's saying, hey, your priests are bad. You guys are not worshiping God. But he starts with, I have loved you. This morning, I want you to lean into this. If you want to be a generous giver, you have to understand the love the Father has for you. We see this in the New Testament, the new covenant. Because you know what? Malachi is pointing to Jesus. And so this new covenant that we see in the Gospel of John, for God so loved who? The world. God so, for God so loved the world. You can put your name in that. For God so loved Justin. For God so loved you. What did he do? He gave. Can y'all say that with me? He gave. Okay, 930 did better than y'all. He gave. He gave. If we want to be givers, we have to understand that our Father is a giver. He gave His most prized possession, His one and only Son. Why? So that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Giving is in response to His grace. Giving is understanding that I have nothing and that God gives me everything. The gospel is not making bad people good. It's making dead people alive. And so when we understand that, hey, I want to give the the investment, the gospel and giving, we have to understand we cannot give something we don't have. And God gives us everything. We see that the covenantal God that wants us to return to a relationship with him is the one that through his grace is giving us. People who give generously understand they have been forgiven greatly. So if you want to be a generous giver, then understand that you have been forgiven greatly. Because when you are forgiven much, you will give great. But when we look and see, are we understanding the grace of God, the unmerited favor of God, The first step is to us to realize what God has done for us and ultimately giving his son, Jesus Christ. But then when we understand that grace, do we walk in it? Or do we look and we say, oh, I know God has given me things. I know God has blessed me beyond measure. Then do we start focusing on the the blessings and lose sight of the God who blesses? That's the second thing. Giving is a response to his gifts. Because in verse 7 it says, how shall we return? You have the people of God saying, return to me. How shall we return? We have physically come back. The Persians have allowed us to come back and inhabit Jerusalem. And he says, no, it's not just physically. But he's saying spiritually, I want you to worship me. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. He was tying the giving back to the temple is saying that your hearts are far from me. How we give is a reflection of the status of our heart. What do we start with? How can you tell what's most important to someone? Where they spend their time and what they give their money to. This is what Malachi is saying to them. You are robbing God. And then just like us today... The people of Israel respond and say, how are we robbing God? 
You know, often many times we look and feel very entitled. Giving is a response to his gifts. But what we say is, God has blessed me, but that's my stuff. That's my money. That's my, you know what, time. That's my possession. Those are my things. What is The problem is that we are entitled. But the problem with entitlement is it's easy to see in others and it's hard to see in ourselves, And it's easy to see in younger generations. When you look at kids, it's very easy to see entitlement in my kids. How, you know, how dare you not be thankful for the toy? You have a whole room full of toys. I'm going to take all your toys away. You know, or maybe you look at millennials and say, and they're so entitled. They want everything that we worked hard for. Or maybe you look at my generation, the 30s and 40s, and say, oh, they want, you know, nice cars, big houses. They don't understand, you know, what, the things you have to work for. But then it may be the 50s and 60s, you know, the 70s and 80-year-olds look at the 50s and 60s and says, oh, those young people don't know anything anymore. Entitlement is a state of the heart and not an age. And when we start looking and seeing that this entitled mentality that I have a right or a claim to something, then we miss the idea that God provides for us, but there is more blessing in the provider than just the provision. We are not seeking God for his blessings, but because of who he is. We are missing the fact that God owns everything. If we are going to be a giver, a giver that is response to his gifts, we have to understand that we don't own anything. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. So every good and perfect gift is from above. Psalm 24, verse 1, says, The earth is the Lord's, and all it contains. You know what all means? All. Everything. So when we understand, when we start getting entitled and have the pronoun problem and say, That's my stuff, my money, my time, my house, my car. We have to understand, no, it's not. It is God's, and He entrusts us to manage it. Everything is God's. We are just managers. But when we start looking, many times we take our eyes off the provider and start looking at the provisions. You know, we take our eyes off, you know what, the one who blesses us and start looking at the blessings. Well, God, when are you going to bless me? When are you going to give me more stuff? Rather than just looking and saying, I want you. John Maxwell, in his book, I'm reading with a group of guys on Wednesday morning, gives, I believe, five really good questions that helps us understand, are we spending too much time focusing on stuff? They're going to bring those questions up. But, you know, you might be entitled if you are preoccupied with things. You know, where does your mind shift when you're just sitting alone? Does it shift on your stuff? Oh, I want new you know, clothes, I want new cars, I want new house, I want new this, I want... Are you preoccupied with things? Then you might be focusing on the, the provisions rather than the provider. The second, am I envious of others? The third, do I find my personal value in possessions? Or even worse, for our generation, do I find my personal value in posting my possessions on social media? You know what, do I find my value in look at the new thing I got, look at the new thing I have? You see, we can't find our worth in our stuff. And the fourth, do I believe that money will make me happy? And number five, do I continually want more? You see, Paul writes in Philippians, I have learned, whether in want or plenty, to be content in all things. That's right before he says, I can do all things through Christ. You see, when we focus on stuff, it's going to be very hard for us to be givers because we're focused on what we are getting. When we look back and see, are we going to focus on the provider and not just the provisions? You see, we see this in our everyday life. When we mature, we focus on the provider. My dad's family, my um, grandparents, called him Mom Paul. Every Christmas Eve, 
You know, we would go down to their house for Christmas Eve, and we would open gifts, we would eat. And it was the kind of gifts that, I mean, it was like one step below Santa Claus. Anything you wanted, you were getting. And we were not the civilized family that opened one gift at a time, and everybody showed it, and, you know, told how thankful we are with that gift. It was just like, you know, craziness. There's wrapping paper flying, there's kids running, there's someone holding something they got, running around, and just thinking, wow, this is awesome. You know, that was you know what, Christmas Eve with Mom and Paul's house. I, and hopefully you don't think less of us, but man, it was just growing up. You look forward to going to Mom and Paul's house for Christmas. And I got awesome gifts. They would always get you the you know, nicest clothes, the coolest gifts, guitars, you know, new video games, like anything you wanted. And, and I remember thinking, they're the best grandparents. You know, they get you whatever you want. But then when you think about the, the Christmases, and now... Ma's been gone for 14 months. My grandpa's been gone for like three years. And as I get older, I think back and I don't want any of the gifts. I wish I could just spend one more Christmas Eve with them. And you know when you think about if you've lost a loved one, you know, and, and maybe it's one of those, you know, things where you don't miss the things they got you. You miss them. You wish just one more conversation with a parent, one more conversation with a grandpa. Man, just one more time to spend some time with them. And here's what I want you to see. That's because now, as you matured and got older, you understand it wasn't the gifts. It was the giver that you loved. It wasn't the, you know, the, the cool clothes or the guitars or the, game, the gaming systems that my grandparents gave me. It was the joy that we had together that I miss. And so when we look and we see God and giving, you know what? Giving is a response to his gifts. We have to get to the point where we say, God, I want you, the giver. You're the giver. I want you and not just your gifts. Because God has blessed us to be a blessing. And so when we look and Malachi is telling the people of God, you have robbed me in tithes and offerings. It says, for you are robbing me. The whole nation, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so there may be food. When we look at 1 Corinthians 4.2, Paul writes about the ministry, but I think it can be applied to financial principles. It is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. You know what? As you steward your finances... Are you using your gifts and blessings to honor the giver? Or do you consume everything for yourself? I, I want us to look th three practical steps. First, you have to understand that giving is a spiritual issue and driven by God. What you believe about God shows a lot about what type of giver you will be. If you trust that God will supply all your needs, I believe you will be more generous. I believe if you trust God and say, God, I want to give to you, and I want to give back to you because everything is yours, you're saying, God, I, I believe and trust you. But when we take and start saying, well, I need more, well, I need this, well, this is mine, well, God, don't touch this area, we're saying, God, get your hands off this area because I know how to run it better than you. We have to see this is a spiritual issue and driven by God. The second thing I want us to see is we have to get on a written budget. It's a dreaded B word. Nobody wants to talk about a budget. In the Bible, when it talks about leadership, when it says without vision, the people perish, the same thing can be applied to our finances. If you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. So you may say, well, I want to give more, but if you don't live on a written budget, you don't know how to. You don't know where your money's going. We have to live on a written budget. You know, we offer Financial Peace University by Dave Ramsey. It shows you how to get on a written budget. And it's hard. But we must, as believers, get a control over our finances so that we can get on a budget. Because many of you want to give and you want to be givers, but you have no margin in your life. Ministry happens in the margins. So many of you are stretched financially where you couldn't give even if you want to. So the most spiritual thing you can do is get on a budget so that you can order your finances so that you can, you know what, give every dollar a name and give 
to what God has called you to give to. 88% of people live paycheck to paycheck. So if a paycheck doesn't come in, you're not making your bills. You know, the average college student graduates college with $37,000 in debt. You know what? Ministry happens in the margin, and we are stretched beyond our imagination. So the, fir- the first thing we have to do is create margin. We have to tell ourselves, no. No, I'm not going to eat out, you know what, every night of the week. Because when we start looking at our budget, we see where our money is going. Because Malachi was saying to them, you have robbed me. You are not bringing the tithes and offerings in. So the question I want to ask you, are you willing to make the commitment to build margin in your financial life? The same thing happens with time. Oh, I would love to help out in this ministry. I just don't have time. I'm stretched too thin. I'm too busy. Ministry happens in the margin. Are you building margin in your life, in your time, in your finances? I believe when we build margin in, God will bless us beyond measure. When we start looking to say, God, I want to do things your way. But many times we are robbing God. And the third thing I want us to see of how we can practically do this is make a commitment to tithe. Make a commitment to tithe to the local church. You will never be ready. You will never be in a position where you say, oh, I have extra money. Let me just give that to the church. This has to be a commitment. And why do I believe it's a commitment? Because I believe God's chosen vessel to take the gospel to the nations is the church. When we look, I'm jealous of Archie. He posted a couple days ago where he was at the place where Jesus said to Peter, Upon you, Peter, this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not be able to stand against it. You know what? I believe that God has chosen his church to take the gospel to the nations, to use the church and their mission and purpose to reach people, the community, the Acts 2, where they are giving and community happens, where they are caring for one another, happens in his church. So I believe even though the New Testament doesn't teach tithing, like you don't hear tithing in the New Testament, I believe it is a very New Testament idea. Jesus talks about proportionate giving. As you've been blessed, bless others. And so if we understand that God's own everything, the tithe is the beginning. It's a starting point. And that we want to give to the church. And you may say, well, I don't trust the church. I don't trust the leaders. I don't know what they're doing you know, with that. If you look in Malachi chapter 2, the priests in the temple were terrible managers. And they were not good priests. But what Malachi is saying to his people, I want obedience from you. And then I will deal with the church. It's about our obedience. And when we look and we say, well, since, you know, Jesus didn't talk about tithing. Jesus didn't come to, you know what, abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. And so I believe when we look and see the ceremonial law, the civil law that that we don't see applies, but through the blood and the new covenant, the moral law, I believe giving is a moral issue. Who are we going to give to? And I believe that we have to say, I want to structure and be a part of giving to the local church. You know, when we look and we see, I'm committed to doing this. We have seven ways to give. And I wanted to bring this up because... I think I'm the last of the checkbook generation. I'm 38 years old, and I don't think my kids will ever have a checkbook. You know, I'm thinking, oh, I want to write a check, I want to put it in the envelope, and I want to give. But when you make a commitment to giving to the church and tithing, I believe that we have to show the next generation, hey, this is what it means to give to the local church. This is what it means, you know what, to believe in the mission of God that he has set up through his local church. And you can do that online. In the black box, you know what, through an app, through drafting or through texting. And I know my parents, you know, are saying, I'm not texting my, you know, anything. It's safe and it's secure, but we can teach our people. We can teach my family. I can sit with my kids and say, let me look and show you on the computer how we are giving to God. And I want to tell you, when we look and we see giving is a response to his gifts, I want them to see God has blessed us so that we can bless others so that we can give, so that we can invest in eternity. Why? Because I believe in the mission and purpose. That's the last thing. Giving is a response to his goal. God's goal is that 
everyone would come to know him. You know, he is not slow, as some count slowness, but desires all to come to repentance. When we look and we see, you know what, the, the covenant he made with Abraham. Obey, step out, and I will make you a father of many nations. I will, you know what, see my kingdom come through your obedience. We see Jesus Christ standing with his disciples right before he ascends. And what does he say? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and teaching them to obey everything. You see, if we don't believe his goal, his mission, then we will not give. Look in verse 12. He says, All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land. The goal of God is to be a blessing to his people so that they can get the gospel out. We give to the church because I believe in its mission and purpose. We look and he says, you are robbing the storehouse. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Why? So that there may be food in my house. Many times their tithe was, you know, of, of mint and thyme and the, the flock. They were bringing this in so that the worship of God could happen. When we look and see the church, the chosen instrument of God to reach the nations, that God wants to fund that and fuel that by the giving of his saints. Why? Not so we can build bigger buildings. Not so we can have, you know what, a, a, the American dream. It's that so the nations will call upon the Lord. And so when we look and see, why do we give? Because we believe in the mission that God has set out. And we believe in the community that he has created, this family of faith that we want to be a part of. You see, in the last part of verse 10, when it says, Test me now if I will not open for you windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. What we have to understand is that giving, when we give to God, we receive the blessing. But the blessing is not bigger houses, bigger cars, more money in our bank account. The blessing is walking more intimately with God. The blessing is Him. And so you may give and you may sacrificially give so that the gospel can go forward, so that God's church you know what can be used, and your blessing is walking with God. Your blessing is, I want to know him more intimately. I want to be, you know what, in tune with him. And we see that too many times we, th we think of and hear blessings as, well, I'm going to give because God's going to give me more. You know what, when we look and read Hebrews 11, those men and women gave everything. They gave everything. And this world was not worthy to be called their home, but they had faith. You see, when we look and see, giving is a response to his grace, his gifts, and his goal. I'm not standing here saying, hey, give to this church because God needs your money or because this church needs your money. Give to this church because you believe in what God's doing. God doesn't need our stuff. It's all his you know, when we look and we see, if we don't collect another dime in this church, I believe his mission will still go forward. You see, we miss out on the blessing. God doesn't need us. His purposes and his mission will be accomplished with or without us. I want to invest in something that matters. Jim Elliott was a, a graduate of Moody Bible Institute. And three years before, Billy Graham had graduated from Moody. And Billy Graham had just started his crusade ministry when Jim Elliott was graduating. He was about to go do a crusade in, in L.A., and Jim was graduating. And Jim Elliott felt called to the Aka Indians in Ecuador. But his professors, his friends, and everyone was looking and saying, Jim, you're too good of a preacher. Man, you're, you have such a winsome personality. Don't go to the Aki Indians. Let God use you to mobilize people to go. You have such gifts. You know what? Don't go and just reach out to the Aki Indians. And this is what Jim Elliott wrote in his journal. I dare not stay home while the Akas perish. 
So what if the well-fed church in the homeland needs stirring? They have the scriptures, they have Moses, they have the prophets, and they have a whole lot more. Their condemnation is written on their bank books and in the dust of their Bible covers. American believers had sold their lives to the service of money. And then like a paragraph later, he said this, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. You see, Jim Elliott understood that giving is ignited by the gospel and not enforced by guilt. He had people saying, hey, don't give your life. Stay here at the church. You're gifted. You're a really good speaker. And he said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. We cannot keep stuff. We cannot keep money. We can pass it down. You know, we can leave it an inheritance. But I can tell you, we cannot lose eternal rewards. We cannot lose living for Jesus. We cannot lose an intimacy with God that when we see him face to face, he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want to use every ounce of my life, my time, my talent, my treasures, my money to go to making much of Jesus. That's what investments mean. What are you investing in? You see, Jim Elliott got it. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You see, I'll end with the way I started. The ease of giving increases based on the level of importance that is perceived. The mission of Jesus is infinitely important. There are people who do not know the gospel. There are people in our city who do not know the love of Jesus Christ. Will you give so that they can hear the gospel, so that we can engage in gospel, you know, at work? This morning, what do you need to give? Maybe you need to give your life to Jesus Christ because you can never be a giver until you've experienced the forgiveness he offers. You know what? Maybe you need to commit to tithing as a family. And it's not a church need basis, it's a family basis. I want my family to bring the tithe into the storehouse. I want my family to understand that we are blessed beyond measure and I want to give. Maybe this morning you need to step into the offering plate and say just like Jim Elliott, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You need to give everything and say, God, I don't know what this means. I give you everything. Do in me what you will. What do you need to give this morning? I pray that God raises up a generation of givers because of his grace, his gifts, and his goal. And may he start in us. Let's pray. Father, I pray as we come to this time of invitation that you would stir the hearts of your people. Lord, this would not just be another end of a service, but Father, that that you would draw us to what you would have us to give. Maybe we need to give our lives to Jesus. Maybe we need to return and commit to tithing to the local church. Or maybe there's just some area we need to give to you. Lord, I pray this morning that you would stir in us the heart of of a generous giver. And Lord, you would remind us of your giving heart that you gave your son, that we may have life. Lord, draw us to you this morning. In your name I pray. Amen.